that it is so easy to overestimate the fit of today's leaders to tomorrow's opportunity. You take a look at Microsoft, you take a look at Facebook, you take a look at Amazon, and you sit and you say hundreds of millions, often billions of daily users, tens of billions of cash flow, many of the most talented engineers in the world, incredible stickiness, sometimes protected by government regulations. And it's impossible to say, how doesn't that fit tomorrow? But we've been here before. This episode is brought to you by Paraswap, the leading aggregator to find best prices across various DEXs. You'll hear more about them later in the show. All right, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Empire. I'm going mano e mano with Matthew Ball. Uh, I was trying to think of the way to introduce uh, Matthew Ball and it uh, th- this one saying came to mind. It's like, you know, you know how there's this saying about the, the smartest person in the room. That is Matthew Ball. He is known through the tech, the gaming, the media community as a brilliant writer, a strategist, a technologist, an investor, and these are my words, not his, a master of the metaverse. Uh, more specifically, he is a managing partner at Apelion Co., which is an early stage VC fund and advisory firm, a venture partner at Makers Fund, uh, an advisor to KKR, co-founder of the Ball Metaverse Research Partners, which creates the index behind the Round Hill Ball Metaverse ETF. Uh, resume keeps going. He's got top positions at Amazon Studios, uh, Churnin Group, if I remember correctly. Accenture was once a full-time forest firefighter, our producer told me. Uh, so you do it all. Matthew Ball, welcome to the show, my friend. <laughs> well, thank you for the incredibly <laughs> kind introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here. Forest firefighter, is that a true story? It, it is a true story. I'm Canadian, and I did that for two years. We were initial attack. The first people on the ground fought fires from 0.2 acres to 3,500 hectares. We'd hello, helicopter in, sleep in a tent, in a wet sleeping bag, in wet clothes, Four weeks. Very different than today. It's no, it's no wonder that you are so into the metaverse. I, I, if I had that experience, I'd be like, I'm going full digital. I'm doing nothing physical <laughs> for the rest of my life. I'm going all in on digital. So, um, Matthew, I, I, I want to get into um, really deep into just like your, your vision for the future. And I want to pull as much out of your head as possible. Um, but I think a good starting point would be, I think when you talk about the metaverse, maybe two or three years ago, the term was quite helpful. Uh, and now it actually doesn't really feel like a, a helpful term. Um, I think everyone has a different idea of what the metaverse is. So actually, just as a starting point for this conversation, I would love to just hear you introduce the concept of the metaverse as you see it today. That's a really great place to start. I think anyone listening to this podcast is doubtlessly familiar with the fact that the metaverse comes from 1992 in Snow Crash. But of course, the ideas of a virtual plane of existence effectively parallel to the real world That spans back nearly a century into the 1930s, where we have the first science fiction novels to discuss VR, AI environments and nurseries, actually building and living out life in simulated worlds. I define the metaverse as follows, a massively scaled and interoperable network of real-time rendered 3D virtual worlds, which can be experienced persistently and synchronously by an effectively unlimited number of users, each with an individual sense of presence, while supporting continuity of data, such as identity, communications, payments, objects, and history. What I'm effectively doing is describing where I started, which is a parallel plane of existence. We've thought about the metaverse in some way, shape, or form, or name for a century, but it's only recently that we have the requisite mix of technologies to pull it off. You're certainly right that in recent months and certainly the past year, we've had a lot of narrative shift what the metaverse means. Ultimately, the term is not that important. I talk about the metaverse as in a single unified experience akin to the internet. We don't say an internet. We don't say the Facebook internet. But whether or not we use the term the metaverse or a metaverse, whether or not we talk about the internet, the decentralized internet, virtual existence, In China, they use the term hyper-digital reality. It doesn't matter. We're ultimately just talking about an observation that an ever-growing share of our time, labor, leisure, spend, happiness, wealth, life is going to be inside virtual environments. Hmm. 
That's an, that's a, it's a really interesting comp- uh, way, way to frame it. And I've heard you use this analogy on almost defining the metaverse as, as being comparable to asking someone to explain the mobile internet, right? Uh, people struggle with this. They're then inclined to define it really just on their personal experience, right? So your average person, like I might explain mobile as like, well, it's my iPhone, right? Like I've got Uber and Snapchat and things like that. A developer might talk about the standards and the protocols. Uh, and if you ask that to someone in the 1990s, like good luck in getting a smooth answer out of them. Um, so when I hear you explain it like that, it feels like your comparison is, uh, I, I almost start to think about like where the metaverse lives on the tech stack, right? So you would compare the metaverse to the internet rather than like, uh, the, like Facebook or Microsoft. Um, so, so that's kind of the analogy, right? Is, is, is comparing it to there's one internet, there is one metaverse. Yeah, that, that's quite right. I mean, we're thinking about it from the protocol stack perspective, the technologies and experiences which create a field of other things, mostly at the application layer, right? That analogy that you're referring to, I really like because the internet does mean different things to different people, or at least it's described differently. And that is partly a reflection of how many things make up the internet and are required for the internet, and partly a reflection of the enormous impact that it has had. It is extraordinarily relevant to a healthcare professional as an investment banker, as a teacher, as a network engineer, but in very different ways. And this is where we get into this question of decentralization, centralization, what is in the stack versus what is at the application layer. Those are all different questions, right? How do we operate the internet and how concentrated is engagement on the internet are both separate questions, but also codependent. When you talk about, or I guess when you ask people when the metaverse comes, you hear maybe three or four answers, right? So if you talk to, uh, if you talk to maybe Tim Sweeney, right? You, Tim Sweeney is going to say the metaverse is emerging over a decades long, right? Multi-decade time horizon. Uh, Zuckerberg might say, okay, the metaverse is not here yet, but it's here in five to 10 years. If you talk to maybe the folks at Microsoft and Satya Nadella, they're going to say the metaverse is here. Um, already, right? We're already living in the metaverse. I'm on Zoom eight hours a day. We're recording this virtually. Why why are there so many different interpretations of this? So I think that there's really two different elements here. One is the social element. And I'm not going to use this to litigate against any one perspective because I'll get to exactly why there are varying answers in a second. But we always have compression of timing, of urgency. You know, you're talking about Satya Nadella at Microsoft. Bill Gates has this famous adage where he says that we overestimate what we can do in three to five years, but dramatically underestimate what we can do beyond that. And yet, ultimately, narratives shift to the time horizon, the now, tomorrow, overmorrow, not years from now. And so I do think that as we went through the rush in 2021, which coincided with such a rapid J-curve in NFTs, that there was a tendency to talk about the transformation as, if not present, certainly imminent. And so we had the people who said decades get drowned out by those who talk about coming decade, get drowned out by those who are saying tomorrow, get drowned out by those saying today. But ultimately, all of these perspectives are valid because there's no individual answer. I like to talk about the mobile internet. If you ask someone when was mobile here, we generally believe somewhere in the late 2000s, but there's no literal answer. 1973, we have the first mobile network call. 1991, we have the first wireless digital network. That was 2G in Norway, but only in Norway. 1992, we have the first smartphone from IBM, if you can believe it. 1999, we have WAP, wireless application protocol. That's what made primitive versions of the web accessible on a mobile device. Older listeners will remember when the mobile internet was a white background with red, purple, and blue text when you clicked a link. By the early 2000s, we hit the first mobile-centric content, media, and services companies, primarily in Japan. Then we have the iPhone in 2007, the iPhone 3G, which had 3G and the App Store. And somewhere after that, we said mobile was here. But there's no literal answer. There was no before and after. We can't specifically say mobile arrived on this day, but we can point to individual markers. And we can say that by some time in the early 2000s, that era had arrived. We lived in it. The more relevant question 
is when was it too late? When did you have to start investing? Hmm. Okay. Let me here I'll give you my I'll give you my version of when of when mobile really started. And I think there are three there are three time periods to look at. And, and, and two of them are what you said. So the first is 2007 when the iPhone launched. The second is 2008 when the App Store launched. But I would say that mobile really was here to stay when in early 2012, Zuckerberg redirected all of Facebook, if you remember that, uh, redirected all of Facebook to focus on mobile. He basically abandoned his laptop, started working primarily from, from, from his phone, uh, Made He forced PMs to disable all their own desktop versions of Facebook, forced them to instead use the mobile versions. So that felt like the that felt like the 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 turning point for mobile. and and maybe maybe you might argue that was a little late. I'm curious. I mean, Zuckerberg interviewed you, actually. You didn't interview Zuckerberg. If I remember correctly, Zuckerberg interviewed you at the launch of Meta. Um, and I'm just curious if if you think that was the turning point for the metaverse. I think that's. That's a funny point in reference. Certainly, Facebook changing its name to Meta Platforms is as much of a mic drop declaration as we've seen in decades past. It was at the time the seventh largest company on earth. I actually like to use this to highlight how it's different from buzzwords past. We're all familiar with words being hyped up long before they're possible or practical, drone internet or autonomous vehicles. Buzzwords that came and went and weren't what we expected them to be. 3D TVs, not disruptive. No one wanted them. And yet those comps don't actually fit here. No one renamed themselves 3D TV, not least of all the seventh largest company on earth. The other day, McKinsey published a report saying, and this is not speculative, it's based on their math, that 30 billion will be spent by the big five tech companies on the metaverse this year. They estimated that private equity, VC, and big tech at large would spend $130 billion this year. In 2021, we saw, before Mark ever uttered the word publicly, Tencent unveil its metaverse initiative, hyper-digital reality. We saw Microsoft, in May of 2021, unveil their metaverse stack. We saw this absolute rush. Unity and Roblox both wrapped themselves around the theme of the metaverse at the end of 2020 and early 2021, the biggest gaming IPOs of the past decade. And by the end of 21, they were the two largest companies, except for Tencent and conglomerates such as Microsoft and Sony in that field. And so I absolutely agree with you that that mic drop singular moment was so much around the, I think, October 27th name change. But it was a culmination of many, many reinforcing trends, which, frankly, probably gave Mark the confidence to make that name change in the first place. Let me play this out a little more because I think so. So when when crypto native folks talk about the metaverse, they say we don't want to live in Mark Zuckerberg's metaverse. We don't want to live in Microsoft's metaverse. Let's build the metaverse on these open rails, on these open crypto native Web3 rails. Does that even argument Makes sense in in your framework of what the metaverse looks like, where we'll have these like closed, the Microsoft metaverse, the Facebook metaverse, Uh, maybe maybe it's even better to call them worlds, the Facebook world, the the Microsoft world, and then you'll have these, the the open metaverse built on crypto rails. Is that, does that logically make sense in what your view of the future looks like? So I think it does. I would just frame it a little bit differently. First and foremost, I want to stress that my opinion would be that we shouldn't think about centralization versus decentralization. You never get just one or the other. And a good version of that is the first web, web 1.0, which we love and in many ways we want to get closer back to. That was mostly built on effectively public goods, TCP IP. And yet we still had pretty significant centralization of sorts. We still mostly spent time on the Google platforms, or increasingly on the Amazon web, Yahoo, AOL. Certainly, when you take a look at Facebook, that's another good example. And that was just a natural feedback loop of habit, of brand, of building more products and services. There are lots of natural centralizing efforts. A good example of that is actually just how much better technically would Bing have to be for us to try Bing? How much better would its data collection need to be for us to try it? Most people don't even think about making that decision. 
Why? Because first and foremost, Google's probably better. They're specialists. They have a much larger training set of users and time, but we have immense habit. And that's likely to endure when you take a look at the metaverse. Irrespective of the underlying openness of protocols, there are forms of centralization. We see this with OpenSea right now. It charges more than other marketplaces. But of course, most people still use OpenSea because they like it. It works well. They trust it. Now they're getting into verification services as well. But the more important point is that even if centralization de facto or technical is often positive, even if we want part of it, or it's often necessary to pull off the technology experiences we want, we generally believe that we went way too centralized over the past 15 years, way too much. And the argument for blockchain and crypto, one that I deeply believe, comes to the fat versus thin protocol theory, which Fred Wilson has really advocated for at Union Square Ventures, Chris Dixon talks about. And they say that the fundamental problem is not that application layer companies like Instagram became very successful because they built great products that people loved. It's that TCP IP was too thin. The protocol layer was too thin. You have IP address, you have DNS and others, really crucial parts of how the internet works, but too much sat at the application. Your account sat at the application layer. And that meant someone owned your account. You own your IP address or the internet, quote unquote, owns the IP address. I can administers it. But what really mattered was your account. Then you have the social graph. Where does that sit? At the application layer. Where do your files sit? At the application layer. And so the result of that was extraordinary lock-in, combinatorial lock-in. And what that meant is that even if the internet was quote unquote open, even if you and I could go make our own Instagram, we really couldn't. You couldn't move a network. There was too much loss to the consumer. And so what I find enriching about this current movement is this idea that if we're having a reset point, and that's important because intra-cycle changes are hard, cycle to cycle changes provide a lot of opportunity. If we can reset so that more of the quote unquote internet's underlying operations are open, they are not corporate owned, the lock-in to the extent it exists is based on the user's choice, then we have, at worst, it's a world that's far less controlled than today. And at best, we have a version of the world we have in the real world, which is you own your things, you want to move out of state to a state that offers better taxes, better legal protections, a community that you prefer rather than the community that you grew up with, you can do that. And that's hard today. Hmm. I mean, I think the reason it's hard, and, and you talk about the, the FAT protocol thesis, which is great piece from, I think it was 2015, Joel Monegro and, and Chris Berniski at, at Placeholder wrote that. I think what it really comes down to is like HTTP is a so-called stateless protocol, right? There is, there is no memory built directly into the protocol. It doesn't have a notion of a database. And so if you wanted to build uh, databases, right? If you look at all the big, powerful internet companies today, the Facebooks, the Microsofts of the world, uh, they're really just database providers, e even the big games, right? Like uh, like Epic, for example, or like Fortnite. There's no such thing as an in-game asset. There's just there's just data moving around in databases. And so when I think I think when people talk about uh, a lot of things in the metaverse being built on crypto rails, uh, it becomes interesting because I think what a lot of crypto folks would point back to is the interoperability maybe and the ability to port not in-game assets because that's not a... There's no such thing as an in-game asset. It's just in-game data, really, data on databases. And so you have data inside of a uh, uh, an open database, maybe on crypto rails, or data inside of a company-run database, like by Epic or Apple or Facebook or Microsoft. So I'm curious how you think about the pros and cons and and almost the trade-offs of of building these worlds on, on, on private databases versus in public databases. So I think you've hit on a really fun point and... That is kind of this idea of what is the appropriate return from operating a database or put another way, what is the appropriate ongoing return from data stored today in your database for activities that happened a decade ago? And that is actually, frankly, a much broader problem. It's not just about Instagram, but let's say Steam, probably the most powerful uh, 
pure standalone software distribution business on earth. And that's because if you use Steam today, like I do, it has 25 years of games or 19 years of games that I've purchased there. I bought them. The services were rendered. Steam played an important role there. But absolutely none of that entitlement is actually an entitlement to me. I can't take it elsewhere. I'm forever chained to Steam. If I want to open a game that I bought in 2004 from potentially even a game publisher that doesn't exist anymore, but even if it does and I want to spend anything, everything has to go through Steam. And so we come up with this fundamental question of what is the appropriate compensation there? I would disagree with you a little bit to say that say Fortnite is primarily about the assets that are stored in the database because this is a specific example of a title that is updated week to week, experiences very significant changes. I believe they have 15,000 develop or 1500 developers or more fine tuning that. It is a good example of where the primary utility today of all in-game things are their application within said game. But you do come up to this question of over time how does that change? But more importantly, what is the argument for me, someone who's had Fortnite for four years, who's probably spent several hundred dollars of continuing to maintain custody of those things that are argued to have been purchased by me? And then the practical consequence is if I ever want to go elsewhere, I face another version of the Instagram problem, which is okay. Blockworks launches a game. I love the game. You actually go out and you pay Disney for all of the IP rights for Marvel. Now I, as the user, need to go spend hundreds of dollars again to buy the same outfit in another environment because the thing that I previously purchased actually wasn't a purchase. It was actually a rental. And worse still, it was a re rental whose utility was exclusively tied to whether or not I maintained interest in a thing that I can't guarantee I will be interested in. All right, everyone, really excited to share a special update from our friends at Paraswap. Paraswap has been pushing the boundaries of what is possible with DeFi for years, and they just did it again. They just rolled out the first ever NFT peer-to-peer -peer mobile trading app on iOS. That's right. They launched an iOS app for peer-to-peer -peer NFT trading. You can buy and sell NFTs with any token. They have a secure non-custodial wallet. Uh, you've got a fiat on-ramp with zero fees at all. That's all at paraswap.io forward slash beta. Paraswap.io forward slash beta. It's a peer-to-peer -peer NFT trading app on Apple. Pretty crazy thing in the iOS ecosystem. Imagine not using a platform that could literally save you thousands on gas. That's Paraswap. Go check out the app. Go check out the native wallet to store all of your crypto assets in one place. Go get your gas refunded. Go check them out. Go download the new Paraswap NFT trading app, paraswap.io forward slash beta, paraswap.io forward slash beta. Now let's get back to the show. Uh, I, I think I've heard you use the, the term, the idealism of, of interoperability. And I think a lot of crypto folks say one of the best parts about building on crypto rails is that you can just move your assets from one game to another. I want to just I want to get your take on, I, I think it's you who said the idealism of interoperability. I want to go deeper into like, is this a realistic future where you can just, you can buy that, you can buy that jersey and, in, in, or you can buy the sword in Fortnite. You can move it over to, to Halo where it becomes a gun. You can take it into Madden where it becomes a trick play. Like, is that a realistic future or is that uh, almost too optimistic? Because there are no incentives to actually build that kind of a world if you're a game developer. So if you believe that the experience you just described has utility to the user, that is to say, I value it, you value it, that perhaps the developer who creates game B values it because they don't need to generate all of the items in and of themselves, and they want to tap into extant investments by you. In my case, I just mentioned all of the Spider-Man stuff I bought on Fortnite. Then I do believe that there will be value there. Now, that's a tautological argument, but my point is, if people want it, there will be value. If people don't want it, then there's no value and there's no point discussing it. I'm optimistic that there is value there, and I think that you can easily identify it. Obviously, in Roblox, their 70 million worlds are interoperable. I don't think kids would be buying as many avatars and skins in Roblox if they had to use them on a one-by-one-by-one -by -one -by -one basis. Would you? Are you a sports fan? What was the last jersey you bought? 
I bought a, uh, I think it was a Teddy Bruschi <laughs> Patriots jersey. So there's this question of, would you have bought that jersey if you could only wear it in a stadium? Probably, but what would you have spent on it, right? $10 maybe? Mm. What if you could only wear it five times? Or what if it only had utility as long as you, your favorite player was on the team? I'm, gonna, I'm too Canadian to tell you much about the NFL, let alone the Pats. But you get the point. And so I'm optimistic that there is utility here. And I think the crypto community has made clear how much they value it. Mm. But the technology problems are really hard. And I think this is one area where I really get excited by many of the conversations, but we get really, really deep. And so, for example, I've often made the point and I often hear criticisms back from the Web3 and blockchain community and developers where I make the point of we haven't really figured out how to have the full end-to-end system for interoperable assets be decentralized. And one of the fundamental problems here is that the instance of the game let's say the multiplayer services or the actual run execution on your device are still being centrally managed. We haven't really figured out how to run peer-to-peer gaming networks. And so what that means is we still have to have in some way, shape, or form, it doesn't matter if you use IPFS, which is great for decentralized storage of the good, but doesn't solve for decentralized operation of the environment, we still have centralization. That gives us multiple, multiple different choke points. And so that is to say, we have some standards, certainly, that we're seeing in blockchain, and IPFS is ported from before that. We clearly have culture that wants it. We have many games that are embracing it, but we don't yet have an end-to-end system for it. And what that means is we still have tech problems that we need to solve. There's still middleware needed to, quote-unquote, interoperate, and we still face fundamental chokeholds that for those who fear the arc of centralization from initially decentralized participants, there's still reason for concern. Matt, Matthew, I just had a light bulb moment as you were saying that, talking about the, uh, about the jersey in the stadium. Uh, uh, man, I'm trying to almost form, uh, formulate this Let's sentence it. as it's coming into my head, which is uh, f- the physical world is default open, right? So there's no, when you buy that jersey, I can I can walk anywhere in the world with that jersey. So so therefore, like the the physical world um, is default open. The digital world is actually default closed because of the way that code is written, right? So if like I buy uh, if I buy the if I buy the jersey in Fortnite, you you have to actually the other game developers have have to consciously add that into their game. I've ne- I've never thought about it like that. Uh, that the physical world is default open, the digital world is default closed. Um, yeah. Huh, that's interesting. I don't even have a question there, but <laughs> what you're formulating on the fly is is precisely right. And in my book, I go into my favorite way of thinking about this. You also correctly analyze that there's no such thing as an interoperable asset because what we're talking about data is data, and data isn't an atom, right? Atoms are essentially right once run everywhere. That's actually why you're talking about them being open. And so what that means is data is only interoperable if you have systems which accept the data, systems which read the data, and systems that then apply said red data in the appropriate context. And so I'll break down to how you would describe interoperability, openness in the real world. If you purchase a pair of Nike shoes and you want to go into an Adidas store, what has to happen for your shoes to not be interoperable? You effectively need to hire a security guard, pass a policy, and then Adidas needs to say, no, you can't bring these shoes in there. But even that's a bit of a hack, right? Because the shoes do work there. We're just choosing to reject them. That's expensive. It requires a policy, a person, and enforcement. So what you have is default open. You have to make a choice to exclude. But in a virtual environment, the reverse is true. You are not likely to have the same way of designing code for an asset. And so fundamentally, this question of do Nike and Adidas agree on the fundamental principles of a shoe? Not necessarily. So they would have to agree or make an active choice to build to a convention for one another. Then on top of that, the aforementioned policies are reverse. You need to say, let's have a policy to accept foreign data. Then let's have code, i.e. the security guard, to incorporate it then let's make sure that it works within our environment. And this is where we get into one of the separate issues, which is 
we do have lots of interoperable standards and formats and systems in crypto to facilitate a lot of that exchange, right? You have permissionless access to assets that are stored on a public ledger. So store A and store B can say, let's both use that shoe, right? That's great. It's actually an open form of communication that doesn't require an intermediary and legal contracts to say, let's do it. The challenge is when we're talking about 3D or even 2D in a game, the image itself doesn't come with, say, the metadata for how it's going to be used. And if it does, which it does in some instances, it may not be exhaustive. Let me give you a good example. If Air Jordan wants to issue NFTs based on their sneaker line, those can be read by any independent game developer and they can be incorporated as entitlements that have functions in their virtual worlds. But those NFTs can have some principles, right? They can say, here are the 10 different varietals and here's the speed differential between all of them. But it might be that the games want to apply them differently. So for example, we're going to customize the soul. Some of them are going to shimmer. Some are going to have matte effects. Some of them are going to have customizations on the soul versus the lace versus the lace cap. It's unlikely that all of those NFTs have the requisite information, least of all stored in a decentralized fashion, for those applications and instances. Another thing that's important is different games have different fundamental dimensions. In one game, a shoe might be 10 pixels. In another game, it might be 1,371 pixels. And it might need to have a certain degree of motion, right? How does it move? You know, you can have blocky sneakers. Again, it's actually easier to talk about shirts, right? Tight fit shirts versus loose fit, uh, breathable versus non-breathable. We're talking about all of this metadata that is, envi- that is required for environment A to incorporate object B from one to another. And so when you talk about just the Nike versus Adidas example, that's relatively easy, but it's the code that actually contextualizes the object that's the tricky part. It's difficult to think of a system that fully decentralizes that. And so that does mean at the end of the day, the individual expressions and usage, much like you would do in Axie or frankly Sandbox, comes down to the local developer. That local developer is accessing a trustless database, but you have to trust that it will appropriately manage your entitlement. The nice thing about the Web3 movement philosophically is it doesn't or it doesn't in practice require full decentralization because we know what the community expects. If you're not respecting the philosophy, the culture, the users, then we're at least hopeful they'll be rejected. So in that sense, actually, interoperability of in-game data, in-game assets, is actually probably going to be more prominent within specific ecosystems like, let's say, all of Epic's games will have interoperability, maybe, maybe, maybe one day, or all of Microsoft's games that they've been acquiring might have interoperability, or all of Facebook's games. Uh, but if you, go to a, if you go to seven different games on, on top of Solana, right, it might be quite tough to build an interoperable world amongst them if you have seven different companies running. So I games. would put it this way. Hmm. The way that you should think about it is kind of like the real world, which is to say, we have pretty universal interoperability globally. USD, the metric system, the intermodal shipping container, English. We often have competing standards. You can think of, you know, English versus German versus French. That could be just ETH versus Polygon versus Flow, what have you, right? But then the fundamental interoperability of goods is often dependent upon bilateral agreements. Those agreements are easiest within national boundaries. Think of this as state to state, right? Florida to North Carolina, They're easier on a regional basis. This could be the EU. And they're hardest when you get extra nationally, right? I'm Canadian. And there's more friction to, quote unquote, interoperability of my everything in the United States than it is domestically. But it's harder still to go from Canada to Vietnam. I can't go to Russia. And South Korea is totally off limits. And so the way that you want to think about it is that way. We have technology problems, certainly. We solve those technology problems. But most technology problems are actually masquerading as such. They're human problems. They're interpersonal problems. And so what we're more likely to see is a lot of underlying 
shared interoperable protocols, but for which the application and the experiences are more about loose federations of people working together. That can be a collective on the Solana ecosystem of gains that say, look, let's not concern ourselves with the data conventions for metadata of virtual objects that, you know, party Z is doing. But we're a collective of 20. Let's all code with similar conventions. Let's build with each other in mind. And that's how it works. And that's how if you scale any interoperable system or community in the real world, things work. Your local neighborhood is more tightly integrated than your riding, than your city, than your state, than your country, than your continent, and so forth. Mm. I have one more question on uh, just different worlds, and then I want to get into some of the, uh, the technical side of things, and then I want to get into some of the societal impacts of, of, of all of this. Um, will so, so it's very obvious like who will build some of the big meta, what, what quote unquote web two companies will, will build the metaverse, uh, the Facebooks, the Disney's, the Epic games, the Roblox, they will all have their own worlds within this metaverse. At what point does that stop? Like at what, will, will every company in the world have that? Will maybe the, maybe the second layer is like Nike will have their own metaverse. TikTok will have their own metaverse. Is there, then there's a tier three of companies, uh, like McDonald's and Wendy, like at what point do they stop, do brands stop building their metaverses, their own mini worlds? And then, uh, and, and do they all build their own worlds or do they plug into other people's worlds? Maybe what is your picture of like how, how the big brands of today uh, plug into the metaverse of tomorrow? So there's this quote that comes from Tim Sweeney, the founder and CEO of Epic Games, where he says, just as nearly every person and every company saw fit to build at maximum their own website, but at minimum their own Facebook profile or social profile, that every person and company will want some presence in the metaverse. For the individual, that might just be an avatar or a MetaMask. For the company, that might be their own virtual world platform, or they might do the equivalent of a subway page on Facebook, which is to say a miniaturized world on Fortnite Creative or Roblox, or perhaps a plot of land on Sandbox. That's the most likely arrangement, right? Similar to the internet today, we usually want some form of aggregation in discovery and access, especially for the brands that don't really make sense of standalones, right? Like, yeah, you might go to brand A on their own website. You might download a certain app for a retailer you love, but often you'll just buy it from Amazon, right? Aggregated. Often you'll just read within Twitter or New York Times coverage and so forth. And so that's the likely arrangement. I'm far more interested in two things. Number one is how many of what I call integrated virtual world platforms will we see? That will be your Roblox, your Sandbox, Decentraland, these vast networks of interconnected experiences. We have a few of them today. I expect that we'll see far more. And I'm optimistic that we're still kind of at the ICQ AOL phase. These companies like Roblox or Fortnite Creative seem incredibly powerful, but... ICQ at its peak had 68 million monthly active users. Facebook in 2005 had fewer than 75 million users. That's kind of where we are with these platforms, right? We know Sandbox has about 200,000 monthly active users. Roblox has 250 a lot, but not billions. And so we're likely to see many, many more emerge. The other key lesson is, of course, that we can overestimate how early the race is over. Let's assume... I'm wrong. And that is to say, we're not at the ICQ AOL stage. We're at the late 2000s. Facebook has already been established in the virtual world as an analogy, and it's not going to be supplanted. Well, what happened after that, right? Twitch comes out in 2011. We have Snapchat come out in 2011. TikTok emerges, depending on your definition, 2014, 2016. You have Discord, I think, comes out in 2015. They're all smaller, to be sure, but they're extraordinarily large in their own rights. And they much better serve certain customers, certain use cases. And over time, they do whittle away at the giants. Mm, I think that's a really good framework to look at to look at this through, right? If you look back in the late 1990s, the biggest websites, AOL and MSN, right? Then Yahoo comes soaring past them. Everyone thinks, all right, Yahoo is the winner. And then basically Yahoo dominated for the next several years. 2005, 2006 comes along and Google overtakes 
by far. Yahoo goes back, overtakes Google. Google comes back and overtakes. Then Yahoo and Facebook come soaring past them. And I, 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 yeah, I think that's a great way to look at it, Matthew. Um, what, what are the technical limitations to all of this? Right? Are we at the? You mentioned we're maybe at the AOL phase. Uh, I've heard you talk about in the 1990s. It wasn't even clear what protocol we were going to use. TCP/IP. The Department of Defense put their weight behind. Uh, OSI is what the Department of Commerce and EU supported. Then the protocols kind of converged. Are we at that phase of things? Uh, and 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 maybe just extending that question out. Like, what are the technical limitations to all of this, both on the software side, but also the hardware side? Yeah, we're very early. And of course, that depends on what degree you believe the underlying internet stack is going to be rewritten, right? We, if you take a look at the Andreessen Horowitz perspective, Chris Dixon believes that a lot more is going to be not literally struck out, but that we're going to revamp far more of the underlying technologies. This is where you get into the fundamental Web3 movement, right? The idea that the future of the internet is going to run on blockchains. If so, we are much earlier. We have multiple competing chains. You just use the example of OSI versus TCP IP. It's unclear whether or not the steady state of a crypto future is going to be multi-chain or not. And if so, we certainly need better bridges. <laughs> we need more bridges. And there's a lot of other intermediary work that's going to be required to onboard hundreds of millions and billions of people. And so that's where you would say, we don't know what the standard is going to be. We don't know what the supporting infrastructure is going to be. And we haven't discovered the onboard experience for the average person. If you're taking a look at a more centralized future, or perhaps not centralized, but traditionally architected future, we're farther along, right? TCP IP is mostly in place, and we're supplementing it with blockchain-based technology into that framework. And as a result, we still face the aforementioned problems of which chain, how, and what's a bridge and wormhole going to look like. But because they're more plug and play, they're not as much of an impediment, right? You don't have to solve first principles to build the second floor of the building. You just start renovating, if you get my perhaps inelegant analogy. But beyond that, hmm. we see fundamental requirements for expanded broadband and network capacity and availability expanded computing power. And this gets to the area that I'm most excited about as it relates to blockchain technology. We face extraordinary constraints in networking and computing power. That is to say, the broadband we have available, the reach of that broadband, especially globally, as well as the amount of computing power we have to sustain and render a parallel plane of existence. There are multiple schools of thoughts on how to solve that. One is, let's just wait. Computing power improves, broadband improves. I find that a discouraging, if valid, argument. Another is, let's just make more things, more processors, more powerful. Let's deploy more fiber. The other answer is to tap into the vast network of unused or underutilized resources globally. And frankly, that's about more than just spare broadband capacity or spare devices. It's actually tapping into collective resources, time, labor, energy, capital, intellectual property, and more than just literal energy, but enthusiasm. Blockchains have proven themselves to me through DAO structures, smart contracts, through things like render token and more to be very adept at doing that putting aside just whether or not it's easier than through traditional contractual models, we see millions of people being corralled in days to extraordinary outcomes. And so I get excited that actually pulling off the metaverse that we want from a decentralization perspective, but also pulling off the metaverse that we imagine technically, we require fundamental decentralization. There are those who believe, for example, that until we can solve the aforementioned issue of peer-to-peer -peer multiplayer services, which would be a decentralized way of operating online multiplayer, we simply can't pull off the metaverse. And if that's true, you need a way to respectfully compensate every contributor, both active and passive, as well as a way for them to feel safe in doing so, and a way to do that easily, right, frictionlessly. That's what gets me really excited. And frankly, that was my primary onboarding to 
Web3 at large to blockchain and crypto. Hmm. If As we start to wrap this up, Matthew, you have this amazing book that's coming out. Uh, I think the release date is July 19th, and it's, it's kind of broken up into these three sections, as, as I understand it. Uh, just defining what the metaverse is, looking at lessons from the past 50 years of building the internet, getting into some of the technological challenges um, in, in the second part and, and really what is needed in the, in the stack to build this. And then third, the societal impacts, as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong there, but one, I want to wrap this up with just talking about if, if you are correct about all of this, you're predicting it, this grand world that has some big changes from what the world looks like today. If you are correct about all of your predictions, what does the world look like that is different and how, you know, look like in five to 10 years and how is it different than today? It's a fun question. Look, I, I actually don't think that the world is going to be that different in 2027. I think there are fundamental things that one can bet on. I used this line earlier, more of our life, labor, leisure, spend, wealth, happiness will in, be in 3D rendered virtual environments, will be in virtual goods at large. We will transition an ever growing share of the activities that we do digitally into said environments. As an investor, both in public equities at the venture level and in crypto, I get excited about what we've learned from era shifts. I talk about the metaverse in context of three prior computing waves, the mainframe era from the 1950s to 1970s, the personal computing era, which was coincident with the rise of TCP IP from the 1980s, essentially to, as you and I discussed, the late 2000s, early 2010s, and then the mobile era. Now we're on the advent of the metaverse, a fourth era, where we start to talk about Web3 and real-time 3D rendering. When those platform shifts occur, we see fundamental shifts in who leads, under which technologies, business models, and crucially, philosophies. That last one ends up having the most societal impact. But I describe in my book in that third section, you encapsulated it well, five different types of outcomes, corporate. The first are the companies that are essentially destroyed by era shifts. Blockbuster doesn't exist. The second category are those that languish. They're so far surpassed, we forget about them. Yahoo is one such example. Skype, another. Skype still exists, like ICQ, but no one thinks about Skype, not even Microsoft, which owns it and launched Teams a few years ago. The third are the companies which adapt and grow. Facebook grew in the mobile era, but it isn't of the mobile era. It predates it. The fourth and the fifth categories are the most interesting to me. The fourth are those companies which are displaced in their core market and grow as a result of changes. Microsoft, more valuable than ever, but it has never had a smaller share of personal computing devices. Note the philosophical implication there. Microsoft, which many believe to be a malcontent in the early 2000s, is more valuable after losing share because it philosophically shifted to a horizontal unbundled strategy. Most of us would say that's a positive change and one that was financially remunerative. Brad Smith, their vice chairman, has said they were on the wrong side of open source and that it has cost them dearly. And then the fifth and final category of companies are the new ones, those who emerge in that era. TikTok in the social era, Google in the PC era, Microsoft in the PC era as well. That's what I think the future is actually going to look like. I think we see iterative change in the years to come. We've had a huge boost over the past two with the rise of social gaming, the real cultural tipping point in my mind in this last cycle for crypto. But in the years to come, we're mostly going to see the powers that be shipped. Matthew, maybe the last question here. Will the metaverse be built by the incumbents or the new folks? Will it be built by the Facebooks and Apples of the world? Will it be built by the games, the Epic Games and the Roblox and Fortnite and Minecraft? Or will, will it be built by crypto native folks building on top of things like Ethereum? The answer is going to be a mix. This is always how it plays out. There's too much infrastructure, for example, that is already deployed by Unity and Unreal when it comes to real-time rendering. And so if you describe the metaverse as I do about real-time rendering services, we actually have nothing close to substitutive in the crypto realm. And so that can start to emerge, but game engines are so extraordinarily difficult. And frankly, they're still predominantly local 
installs, not network-based experiences, because the challenges of latency preclude it. For context, to render a virtual environment, you basically need to process the entire simulation 60 to 120 times per second. Doing that on Ethereum or Polygon or Solana is just not practical, right? Especially as the network becomes more decentralized, you just can't. The speed of light precludes it. And so it's likely that we have a mixture. But again, the real question to me is, how does that mixture change over time? And how does that shift the polar center between centralization and decentralization? Because that has extraordinary consequences on the margin. That sounds like a bad thing. I mean it on a good thing. A really small shift has extraordinary implications. But at the end of the day, the thing I find most inspiring is that it is so easy to overestimate the fit of today's leaders to tomorrow's opportunity. You take a look at Microsoft, you take a look at Facebook, you take a look at Amazon, and you sit and you say hundreds of millions, often billions of daily users, tens of billions of cash flow, many of the most talented engineers in the world, incredible stickiness, sometimes protected by government regulations. And it's impossible to say, how doesn't that fit tomorrow? But we've been here before. There was no real way to look at Microsoft in the early 2000s, 95% share of personal computing devices, nearly 100% share of enterprise software. They were first to mobile. They had 85% share in mobile. They had the internet tidal wave memo corralling the entire company to mobile services. They had extraordinary bundling of their services. The fundamental lesson that I reiterate in my book is all of these companies look ideally suited for tomorrow, even if tomorrow is different. But cash, conviction, resources, and talent have never proven to be sufficient. And so the hardest thing to identify, and the biggest thing that I focus on as an investor, and we'll see if I'm good at it, is the guys in the garage, the six people who just fundamentally bet so differently, but go to market so differently that they displace untold billions of wasted spend. The big thing about crypto is that we see this faster bootstrapping, yes, but we've never seen more people actually able to tap into more resources with limited funding than ever before. That produces the prerequisite on steroids for change. Matthew, I think we could talk for hours about this. Uh, you have a book that is coming out. You've mentioned it a couple times here, The Metaverse, How It Will Revolutionize Everything. Uh, it was selected as one of Apple's but Apple's most anticipated books of the summer. I pulled up the website as we were talking here. The testimonials are insane. Tim Sweeney of Epic Games, the CEO of Sony, uh, CEO of Unity, former CEO of EA, uh, Reed Hastings of Netflix, the CEO of Microsoft Gaming. The list goes on and on. Uh, I'm assuming the best place to buy this is MatthewBall.vc. Yeah, so there are MatthewBall.vc will list all of the retailers. It's available on every outlet, Apple, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, at Norton, which is my publisher. They'll list all of them. But I would strongly recommend for those that are interested to buy at bookshop.org. Bookshop is not particularly well known, but it's an e-commerce solution that supports indie booksellers. 75% of their gross mm. profit goes to independent bookstores. So that is both a non-Web2 supporting and effectively decentralized but indie-focused sales channel. And I love to direct as much business there as possible. I love that. That's great. Matthew, you've been a resource for all of us for years. Uh, really excited about your book uh, and just really appreciate your time. I, uh, I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. I really did. And I look forward to continuing to read. Amazing. Amazing.